Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. After the Ukraine war, who's getting stronger, the Western world or the rest of the world? Let's get to the bottom line. No one disputes that the United States will remain one of the world's leading powers far into the future. But it's also obvious that power is shifting all over the globe. And America's grip has really slipped in some places. It has the biggest military, but there's unease domestically with the cost of involvement in faraway conflicts. Meanwhile, China's influence is rising throughout Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. With high levels of American military aid and dollars funding the Ukraine war, while also dealing with high inflation and mounting debt, is America's global leadership increasingly fragile? Has the argument for Western liberalism lost its allure, especially as nationalism and populism spread throughout the West? And is the rest of the world looking for alternatives to American leadership? Today we're talking with Kishore Mabubani, Singapore's former ambassador to the United Nations, a former president of the UN Security Council, and author of Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy. Kishore, it is a real pleasure to have you on today. And I want to tell our audience that I view Kishore Mabubani as one of the great strategic thinkers of our time. I largely agree with your framing that China is rising. The U.S. sees that rise coming. But I haven't seen America kind of shift very much in terms of how it manages its engagement. You know, it's sort of, I've often been a fan, have, you know, take this moment bring nations like India and Brazil and other great, you know, international stakeholders more into the power institutions in the world, and the United States would get credit for that in a way and would help kind of create institutions that fit the, the world that's emerging as opposed to the one we had 70 years ago. Do you see any prospect of the United States getting ahead of this so it just doesn't look like the resentful, egotistic, you know, former dominant power that's just, you know, irritated with China's rise? Well, I think the, the fundamental problem uh, with the United States strategy, and then actually, sadly speaking, uh, as Henry Kissinger told me in 2018 when I was researching my book, the, uh, on the Has China Won, the United States doesn't have a comprehensive long-term strategy for managing the return of China and actually, what it's trying to do is kneecap China, hoping that China will collapse. And frankly, yes, it's theoretically possible that China could collapse. But I think the current strategy of trying to stop China's rise is not going to work. Therefore, a wiser strategy would be to continue the policy of engaging China, integrating China into the world order, and then constraining China. That's a wiser strategy. That's a win for the United States in many ways, and frankly, a win uh, for, for many of the neighbors of China. And I can tell you, we in Southeast Asia are completely puzzled by what the United States is trying to do. I mean, for you know, is it, for example, calling on Southeast Asia to cut off its links with China? I mean, that would be suicidal. I mean, just to give you one other statistic, in the year 2000, United States trade with the 10 ASEAN countries was $135 billion, and China was only $40 billion. The United States was, you know, more than uh, three, three and a half times larger. But today, even though United States trade with the 10 ASEAN countries has gone up to $300 billion, China's trade with ASEAN has gone from $40 billion to $800 billion, an increase of 20 times. Now, you can't ask countries like Southeast Asia to cut off their trading links uh, and other links with China. It'd be suicidal, right? And China is going to be with us for the next 1,000 years. And this is not just true of, of Southeast Asia. You mentioned Brazil. Brazil is geographically much closer to the United States than it is to China. But Brazil trade, Brazil's trade with China is three times Brazil's trade with the United States of America. So these are the new realities that the United States should adjust to in a more intelligent and a more thoughtful fashion. And to me, it's actually quite surprising how badly the strategic think tanks in Washington, D.C. have performed, because Washington, D.C. spends more 
on strategic think tanks than any other country in the world, and yet it produces the worst strategic thinking in the world. That's quite striking. So, so Keishore, how do you view the Ukraine conflict right now? So many people, I've had them on my show, Andre Kortunov and others, have looked at the Ukraine conflict as sort of the ongoing uh, collapse of the old Soviet Union and America, very comfortable with the old contours of U.S.-Russia competition and kind of old-style stuff. So you've got essentially a proxy conflict now going on in Ukraine, so, you know, with Ukraine supported by uh, European and American support, aid, dollars, military assistance, you know, fighting the Russian invasion, while China is sort of over here, you know, the big power that's rising. How do you sort of see the U.S.? Is the U.S. And, and are, is the U.S. trapped in sort of an old mindset not realizing that the resources and whatnot that are going into that are basically giving China, you know, an easier pass in the world than otherwise would be? Well, I mean, let, let me emphasize at the very outset that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is completely illegal and it's unacceptable. Uh, it has to be condemned and we should uh, certainly try to reverse it. That's all very clear. But at the same time, to be completely candid also, when wars break out like this, they reflect geopolitical incompetence. Mm. And here I would say the European Union and the members of the European Union should step back and reflect on what did they do to have this war, a major war break out in this doorstep. And my simple answer is that they didn't listen to the advice of George Kennan. And by the way, Foreign Affairs has just come out with another article pointing out very clearly that way back in the mid-1990s, almost 30 years ago, George Kennan emphasized that Europe and the United States shouldn't alienate Russia. They should try to integrate Russia in the new order. And I can tell you, frankly, the fundamental difference between what the Europeans have done with their neighborhood and what we in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, have done in the neighborhood is the exact opposite. The European Union has not been inclusive of the larger region, has not been inclusive of Russia, has basically kept Russia out. Whereas by contrast, ASEAN tries to integrate all its neighbors and bring them into their uh, trading, economic arrangements and so on and so forth. So, for example, the world's largest free trade agreement was launched here in, in East Asia at the initiative of ASEAN, and it brings together the 10 ASEAN countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. And what's interesting about this arrangement, you have four strong allies of the United States, China, Japan, sorry, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, together with China and the ASEAN. So we include everybody. And, and I think the European Union is making some huge strategic mistakes by not thinking and calculating what kind of Russia do they want to have at their doorstep 10 to 20 years from now. A defeated, angry, humiliated Russia? You want that for the next 100 years? Or a Russia with whom you compromise and make peace. And I would say the wiser thing to do is to compromise and make peace. Let me ask you um, about a dividing line that many writers are writing about, like Ann Applebaum and others said, the, the dividing line in the world that matters now is that between democracies and autocracies, and that democracies have been put pushed back on their, their heels uh, and that this is a real struggle in the world. She wrote a piece in The Atlantic saying the bad guys are winning. Um, do you see that as an appropriate metaphoric frame? Or do you see blind spots in the way some writers and some strategic thinkers are looking at what's really driving conflict in the world today? Well, I would certainly say to Anne Applebaum, what you mentioned, uh, that yes, she should listen to the democracies of the world. The world's number one democracy is India. 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Second largest democracy, 
is the United States of America. Third largest democracy is Indonesia. So wouldn't it be wiser for United States to listen to the two other large democracies, India and Indonesia, and ask yourself a very simple question. Why don't the other world's large democracies see this as a contest within democracy and autocracy? In fact, frankly, you know, even though I can be, to be very honest, India and Indonesia are very concerned about China's rise. They know they have to handle uh, a stronger and more assertive China. But do they see China as a threat to Indian democracy? Absolutely not. Does Indonesia see China as a threat to Indonesian democracy? Absolutely not. And it's a perfect example when you talk about world's democracies and autocracies. You're using the black and white lenses of the Cold War era in a new world that is multipolar, multi-civilizational, and increasingly, therefore, multilateral. And so the black and white perspectives that has clocked the American mind is actually a big danger uh, to the United States because the reality of the world is far more complex. And most of the countries in the world, I can assure you, want to be friends with the United States, but they also want to be friends with China. They also want to trade with Russia and they want to be able to do business in the Middle East too. So you can see, therefore, it's a complex world. And it requires a completely different kinds of games from Washington, D.C. that sadly haven't come yet. And I say this as a friend of the United States saying, you can win this game, but it's no longer the simple uh, uh, checkers game that you were playing, you know, with two simple sides. It's a very complex game of chess, closer to the Chinese game of Go that Henry Kissinger speaks about in his book on China. Well, let me ask you about China and its blind spots. Um, we recently interviewed Qin Gong, who's now been made foreign minister of China. And with his ascension, we've seen China engage in kind of a charm offensive. He's been in Africa, uh, going around the continent, showing the priority of Africa uh, to Chinese foreign, foreign uh, uh, interests. Um, also, we've seen the wolf warrior diplomats get withdrawn uh, from a lot of posts. And China seems to be trying to engage in different, different terms. But I'm interested when you see the big shift on COVID policy. You see the ongoing uh, uh, controversies over Taiwan and whether Speaker Kevin McCarthy might go to Taiwan on that. What do you see as possibly some of China's potential missteps given its rise? What could it get wrong? Well, I mean, I, I have to emphasize that uh, China is not a perfect country. And certainly his leaders know that they're not perfect. And, and China, like any country, makes mistakes. I mean, it has made mistakes with ASEAN in the year 2012 when they tried to force Cambodia not to have any reference on South China Sea in the agreed ASEAN document. Clearly, it has made mistakes in the way it has uh, tried to exit from its zero COVID policy I and mean, the sudden turnaround was a shock to everyone. Yes, China has made mistakes, and it will continue to make mistakes. But if you step back and objectively look at the bigger picture and ask yourself a very simple question, you know, the world has about 8 billion people. Let's say you take out the 1.4 billion people from China, take out the 330 million from the United States, that still leaves about 6.3 billion people in the rest of the world. Now, if you assume that the rest of the world comprise intelligent societies led by intelligent leaders who know where their interests lie, ask yourself a simple question. Why are most countries in the world stepping up their links with China rather than trying to lock up China in the way that the United States is doing? Why is that so? Are they stupid? Is something wrong with them? And you take, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The United States launched a ferocious global campaign warning countries, don't get stuck in debt trap diplomacy. Don't join the Belt and Road Initiative. You know what happened? 
about 193 countries in the world, Hundred, over 140 countries joined the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, some didn't. India didn't. Australia didn't. Japan didn't. But the majority did. All 10 Southeast Asian countries did so too. So you are dealing, therefore, with China that is a far more formidable, far more strategic, and far more intelligent competitor than anything that the United States has experienced. And it's such a pity that when Chin Gang was in Washington, D.C., and when, and when Washington, D.C. had a chance to get to know Chin Gang and get to know how Chinese thought, what did Washington, D.C. do? Shun Chin Gang. That was a big mistake. The first rule, we, you know, of, of what Sun Tzu said, know thyself, know thine enemy, fight a thousand battles, win a thousand battles. And all I can say today is that most Americans just don't understand the real China. Let me ask you about <clears throat> trade, because you mentioned trade. And one of the things that I found remarkable was the American decision to withdraw from something it had set up. And I know it had a big impact on Singapore, which was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. And I'm interested in whether there are ongoing after effects to that today. So as we've seen the Biden White House come out with an Indo-Pacific strategy, an Indo-Pacific economic strategy, is anyone in ASEAN taking that seriously? Or do you think that the rupture out of the TPP just did too much damage and it's going to take a new TPP to come in to cement American economic engagement in the region? Well, I can tell you that the 10 ASEAN countries want to engage the United States uh, of America. I mean, let me emphasize that. And there are still huge reservoirs of goodwill towards the United States uh, within Southeast Asia. I mean, going back to the days of the Vietnam War, and of course, paradoxically, the country with which the United States fought one of its most bitter wars, Vietnam, is now its best friend in Southeast Asia. And many Americans, by the way, are not even aware of that. So it, it is there are lots of reservoirs of goodwill towards the United States. And anything that the United States brings to the table and says, for example, the Indo-Pacific economic framework, the ASEAN countries will say, yes, let's do it. But let's also be realistic. I mean, unless you join the real game, which is trade, your influence will go down mm. uh, over time. And that's why Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, very wise, he, you know, in, 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 in uh, putting forward the initiative of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and we all leapt to embrace it, even though, you know, the United States set very high standards for joining the TPP. So when the United States, as under Donald Trump, walked away from the TPP, it was literally shooting itself in the foot. And as you know, the, the, the paradoxical and ironical conclusion of the TPP chapter is that the United States is not even thinking of rejoining the, uh, uh, the CPTPP, that is the successor of TPP, but China has applied to join. So the fact that China has applied to join shows again that China is thinking long term and strategically about where the real game is. And I think it's very important for United States to sit down and do some basic calculations. What would happen to American influence, not just in Southeast Asia, in all of East Asia and in the rest of the world, if it is no longer a major trading partner of most countries in the world? Is inevitably uh, the dynamic of U.S.-China, to go back to your earlier statements, one, where it's a zero-sum game, where if they're gaining, America is losing, or if America is gaining, China must be seen to be losing. And does that not end us up in the box of an inev inevitable train wreck? They need to go further. And here, as you know, the hands of the Biden administration are tied by the fact that there seems to be an overwhelming consensus in Washington, D.C., that the United States should only beat up China and not engage in any kind of win-win cooperation, as you suggested. So this is why, you know, I run something called the Asian Peace Program, 
And just uh, this week, we have issued a new article saying that maybe we should, ASEAN should propose win-win-win cooperation between ASEAN, US, and China. And this will give a face-saving way out for the United States because the United States will say, okay, we're not saying yes to China for win-win cooperation. We're saying yes to our friends in ASEAN. If our friends in ASEAN want win-win-win cooperation, maybe we'll do it uh, for them. So we in ASEAN also, I think, want to help the United States to remain engaged in our region. And frankly, there are some areas like climate change, like global financial crisis, where frankly, it is in the interests of the United States to cooperate with China and not to shun all cooperation with China. Let me ask you finally about India, about which you have writ written recently and said India could be a third major pole of power in the world for problem solving. And it reminds me of Bob Zellick's uh, admonition to China that you can rise and you can become a responsible global stakeholder uh, in, in solving the problems of the world. Does India need that same sort of statement? Is India able to rise out of its own self-interest and begin looking at issues like climate or other issues and use its power in a way that's, that's globally stabilizing but also moves its interests over, forward? Mm. Well, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that India's rise today is unstoppable. Mm. I mean, in, you, know, you know, as Angus Madison told us, from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So the return of China and India is perfectly natural, mm. and it is going to happen. And, and frankly, the world would, at a time when U.S.-China tensions are going to increase, sadly, over the next 10 years, the world would be happy to see a totally independent third pole that plays a balancing role and tries to, in some ways, nudge these two big elephants to avoid a total confrontation. And as you know, India is aspiring to become a permanent member uh, of the UN Security Council, and, which I think India should become, not today, but yesterday, <laughs> uh, become a member, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. The best way for India to build up its credentials as to become a permanent member of the UN Security Council is to show that it is completely independent of the United States and China, and it can play a completely independent balancing role and say things to both powers that lots of countries want to say but are frightened to say publicly. Well, we will leave that there. Thank you so much. Ambassador Kishore Mahbubani, Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Research Institute in Singapore, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. So what's the bottom line? Very soon, China is going to have the world's largest economy and a very powerful, sophisticated military. It's an uncomfortable spot for America, which isn't used to sharing power and fears that China's interests and objectives don't always align with those of Washington. Even if neither side wants conflict nor seeks it, there are going to be inevitable collisions and consequences for the world as China tests the lines of power with the U.S. and the U.S. finds its national ego offended by Chinese power. To stay in the game and avoid a tragic collision with China, the U.S. just can't sit back and hold the power it has in the world. It needs to reinvent the terms of its engagement. It has to do some global deal-making with China. It has to find ways to bring other power centers like India into the world's power institutions like the U.N. Security Council. Then America will remain vibrant, engaged, less resentful, and less likely to have a head-on collision with China. And that's the bottom line.